Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello and welcome on this beautiful day. I am Joe A. Strike. I am Associate Dean of the Edwards College of Humanities and Fine Arts, where you're currently sitting. And on behalf of our college dean, Dr. Claudia Bornholt, I'd like to welcome you to the conference, to Ori County, to the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor in the Coastal Carolina University. Uh, dean Bornholt, I'm sorry to say, is not able to be here today. She wishes that she were here. She got called away to an academic conference, okay? The American Conference of Academic Deans Annual Meeting. Now, where would you rather be? I know where I'd rather be. This one, right here, right? I'd rather be hanging out with both teaching folks and academic deans. So, one of the real benefits for me of being associate dean instead of dean dean is that I get to be here. And I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be here in this building, the Edwards Building, because in this building, this is where we house the Charles Joyner Institute for Gullah and African Diaspora Studies. And at the moment, I should say that I'm part of a search committee that is looking for a new director for that institute. Um, our previous director, who some of you may know, Eric Crawford, has moved on to bigger and, well, I wouldn't say bigger, I would say different opportunities. I'd like to give him a round of applause, Dr. Eric Crawford. He's up in Columbia, I'm sure he can hear us in some fashion. We hope to announce a new director in the coming months, but in the meantime, we are benefiting from the excellent leadership of our interim director, Ali Crandall, who you'll be hearing from later. But let, let me tell you another reason why I'm thrilled to be here. In some ways, I now find myself marking time by this conference. The last time this conference met was in early March of 2020. I'll say that again, early March of 2020. 10 days after the conference closed, this campus was nearly empty. Everybody was home. But the last thing I saw at this conference before COVID came rolling through was the banjo concert. Did anybody see that concert replacing the banjo? Yes. For nearly two years, I kept thinking to myself, that banjo concert was the last thing I saw in the before times. That's the last thing I saw publicly with people in a room like this. I mean, look, if that's the last thing you're gonna see for a year and a half, that's a great last thing to see. But in a lot of ways, that concert, for me, sort of marks the end of that thing. This conference right now, I'm hoping, marks the beginning of something else. I'm so happy to share this with you, to be here with you, and if COVID has taught us anything, I'm just happy to be here. So let's all just come together, celebrate, celebrate the rich Gullah Geechee culture, celebrate being in rooms with like-minded people together, having conversations, and celebrate just being um, I'm gonna be quiet here in a second and get off the stage and, and make way for other folks, but before I do, there are a few people that we need to thank. So many thanks to Sel Hemingway, Special Projects Director for Congressman Tom Rice. I'd like to thank Orton Bellamy, who sits on the advisory board of the Joyner Institute. He represents this region on the Horry County Council. I'd like to thank our many sponsors, including the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, South Carolina Humanities, the Bunnell Foundation, the Gullah Preservation Society, the Whittemore Race Path Historical Society, the Village Group. I'd like to thank our Coastal Carolina sponsors, 
the CCU Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Sustained Coastal, the Departments of Anthropology and Geography, English, that's my home department, English, Language and Intercultural Studies, History, Music, and Visual Arts. Last, but absolutely not least, we would not be here today without the support of our major sponsor, the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation. Here to say a few words is the Executive Director of the Donnelly Foundation, Mr. David Barrett. Thank you, David. supporter of this conference since since the inception. Uh, in fact, we had our entire board and staff come to uh, get fully immersed or more fully immersed in, in this program and uh, the work of the foundation in support of Goenichi communities. Uh, we do have a second office uh, other than our Chicago office. It's in Charleston. Our Low Country Program Director is Kerry Forrest, sitting over here to my left. outside of Charleston, and so it's, it's great to have that personal connection uh, uh, at the foundation to, to what we're here all about today. Um, now, I know that um, I am a Kamiya, um, <laughs> but I've been a Kamiya for over 30 years, uh, coming down here both for work and, and recreation. So. Uh, I'm, I'm no stranger to this area, and just like uh, the rest of you, I've seen many, many changes that, has, that have occurred on the North Coast since the 1970s when I started coming down here, and uh, both the positive aspects of that and, and also the challenges. So the foundation works in partnership with several dozen grantees across coastal South Carolina in three mission areas land conservation, artistic vitality, and then collections. And in the collections area, our focus is on bringing to light underrepresented narratives. And last night at the opening reception, we heard from Michael Allen about bringing to light underrepresented narratives. It was a very inspiring talk uh, to, to kick things off. Uh, we know that our support for the Gullah culture and communities uh, expands across all three of our mission areas, and that culture and communities are very much intertwined, and what stories and whose stories get told uh, is also linked to opportunity. So I, I'd like to close by commending the university for having this forward-thinking program. Um, it's an emerging, innovative chapter a place-based focus on history and the, and the history of education. So wonderful that you have um, President Benson, who uh, is a historian uh, as, as the leader of this great university. Uh, you know, we, we all agree that it's very important to be uh, devoting resources to a more complete understanding of cultural history and also the present. Um, and, and thinking about this uh, also related to the future. Again, both the opportunities and the challenges, uh, a couple of the challenges being the uh, rapid development and displacement of traditional communities, and then extreme weather events uh, related to climate change. Uh, 
which uh, are dramatically and uh, disproportionately impacting Gullah communities up and down the coast. Uh, finally, I'd like to just reflect more broadly that this is a very important area of study that relates to a current moment in history uh, with more candid discussions occurring in many orders, uh, including in philanthropy, about uh, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, that, that tie is, is not lost on me as, as uh, this conference uh, uh, kicks off today. Um, by elevating all the voices in this room, uh, it's our hope that the foundation will promote not only a greater understanding of Gullah communities, but also increase the resources to support those communities up and down the coast. So with that, thank you very much, and I look forward to a great conference. For those of you uh, that are just joining us today, I'm, my name is Allie Crandall. I have the pleasure of serving as the interim director for the Charles Joyner Institute. Um, that we have been a long collaborator with the Institute on our relegation focus projects. It's my full time hat with the Athenian Press, our student driven publishing lab. Um, I am, have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Victoria Smalls uh, today, but I just want to briefly make a couple of introductions to our team and familiar faces. Um, so board members, please clear the things from your lap if you're about to say that. <laughs> uh, so uh, we would not be possible without the guidance of both the people who come before and our wisdom bearers, as well as our faculty advisory panel, some of whom identify as Gullah, but all are passionate about the Gullah and African diaspora. Um, so I'd just like to take a moment and ask them to stand um, so that they can be recognized. Yes, please. All right, and you can see that they are humble. <laughs> Um, we also have the pleasure of two individuals joining our team this year, um, Zenobia Harper, who is our Community Outreach Coordinator in Maine, but a woman of many, many talents. Is Zenobia here? Would you come in? Yeah. She led the Plantersville uh, driving tour and, San and part of the Sandy Island tour yesterday, so she may be listening just a bit. Um, but Zenobia has been just a beautiful collaborator. Her position has made, been made possible by the Donnelly Foundation and has brought life into literally every virtual or physical corner of the joint. Institute. Um, I also have the pleasure um, uh, that you'll hear from later is Ashlyn Pope, our new associate director, who is coming home uh, to her root color roots in South Carolina as an assistant professor of art and ceramics, and you'll hear from her in her sweetgrass basket session. Um, it's been uh, just the conversations with these two women um, have been instrumental in many of the activities that you see in your program today. Um, and so I hope that um, you continue to give us your feedback and that you can continue to help us to grow this conference into something that is magical. Um, and of course, if you see Kelly Duncan, she's probably there about two seconds before you actually think that you need her. Um, she is my program assistant, and she, I think, is the only person who gets more excited about the details of this conference than I do. Um, partnerships, teams, collaboration. All of those, especially in figuring out how to do an in-person event and a hybrid event, hello, virtual folks, um, for the first time in two years has been an awakening experience. What do we want to continue and what do we want to leave behind? So I have two stories for you uh, to remind us of how this conference started. Back in 2018, Heather Hodges, as the then executive director of the Delegation Heritage Corridor, sat just upstairs with the then dean and now provost and I, and asked if CCU would like to organize just, you know, a one-day symposium. Not no big deal. We knew that the time was right, that we needed a place to come together as scholars and activists 
and people who do the work. We needed a place to celebrate and connect the dots, but what we didn't know was that we needed a home and that our long-term supporters like the Donnelly Foundation and the Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission would be our partners, our guides, our wisdom bearers in that homecoming. I briefly met, mentioned last night our deep indebtedness to Veronica Gerald, whose work over multiple decades of advocacy uh, brought Gala to Coastal Carolina University in a way that would not have been possible without that tireless and often thankless work. But it is without Victoria that I don't think that this institute would exist. So back in 2013, we had completed the small CD project on spirituals with a then Norfolk State University professor, Dr. Eric Crawford, and the startup publishing lab with the Athenaeum Press. We had completed it through blood, sweat, and tears of our students and probably our community collaborators as well. And we sent copies out for review. Uh, a week later, I answer the phone. I hear a voice that says, this is Victoria Smalls from the Penn Center. I received the CD, and I experienced potentially one of what was the longest five seconds of silence in my life. <laughs> and she says, well, I actually don't have to tell you, because she's great to and I don't have to tell you because Victoria Smalls does the work, has done the work, is doing the work. She has given her expertise, her unwavering focus, and most of all, love and grace to most every angle of what has formed this beautiful quilt, beautiful tapestry, beautiful woven artwork called Bella. From advocating from artists, and performers from her private collection to her numerous talks. She has walked the long road to the Reconstruction Monument. She has represented Gullah culture on most every TV network from Black in America to Good Morning America. She has worked and been instrumental in institutions like the Penn Center, the International African American Museum, USC Buford, a corridor commissioner, a park ranger, and now, <laughs> Executive Director of the Delegation. Please welcome me, join me in welcoming Victoria Smalls. <laughs> Set my timer. There we go. So I can stay on task. Wow, my heart is overflowing and it's beating really fast, not from being nervous, although there, there is that. <laughs> but from just the beautiful words that you shared, Ali Grendel. That day when I called your office and said that I've received the voices of an island, St. Helena Island. I had to pause and take a deep breath, and that's what that five seconds was, is taking a deep breath and invoking the ancestors to help guide me in my next words because the project that you and your students and Dr. Crawford's students had put together was profound and dynamic and it touched me in such a personal way because Deacon Garfield Smalls is a relative of mine who has now is now with the ancestors. So I had to really just Take a deep breath. So with that, I would like to say good morning and thank you to the Charles Jordan Institute for Gullah and African Diaspora Studies. Thank you, Ali, for inviting me to come and serve. And thank you all for being here with us. Thank you. And I want to just start off by, wow, just sharing the, appreci the profound appreciation and gratitude to be able to serve in his capacity as executive director, I, while I was working as at the National Historical Park, Reconstruction Era National Historical Park, I saw myself wearing the uniform and the hat until I retired. And beyond, 
like Betty Reed Soskin, who is over 100 now and still an active National Park Ranger, African American woman. Oh, she was my idol. She is still my idol. And I wanted to be like her. And I just saw myself, like I said, wearing that uniform, standing proud and serving the National Park Service. And serving the ancestors and serving the public and telling the untold stories through my lens as someone who has been so deeply, um, our family being so deeply affected um, and participating within the Reconstruction Era history. So it was September, October when we as commissioners, Gullah Gitche Corridor commissioners received the letter and noticed that Heather Hodges would be taking a semi-retirement, a sabbatical, and our hearts were broken, <laughs> broken, and but then also saw them, just understood the mighty work that she had done, um, that which is evident, and you can see still today. And then my superintendent, Scott Teodorsky, I had just started the job in September, and Scott Teodorsky was like, it's okay, you just started, it's only been a month, but I think you should apply. I was like, no, no, I'm not going to apply. I'm going to stay right here, be this park ranger, wear my uniform, put that hat on. And no, I'm really happy. And, and I get to tell all the stories of our people in this park because it's going to be Gullah people within this corridor that tells the story of who we were before we were here, the brutality of enslavement, the triumphs and disasters of reconstruction, civil rights movement, and here we stand proudly today, survivors of survivors of survivors of survivors on and on. So when he asked me to apply and I said no, and I just was very proud walking down the Buford Street, St. Helena Island, and Port Royal at Camp Saxton, where the United States Colored Troops, the 54th, the 55th, the 1st South Carolina, the 3rd South, 33rd USCT, all served and fought nobly for what we see today. And months went on and Scott said, they haven't filled that position yet. What are you gonna do? I said, I'm not, no, 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 I'm very happy. And then, it, a commissioner called me one day. I was at home, I was sitting on my couch. And the feeling, I was just really kind of puzzled immediately on why he was calling me. And, and I love being of service, but now I'm a federal employee and I have to be very careful about what I do. And he called and he said, Victoria, I'm just not gonna beat around the bush. We wanna invite you to apply for this position. Will you consider it? And I said, yes. Immediately, and that wasn't me. I don't feel that was me saying yes. <laughs> I felt like it was the ancestors working through me, like me being this hollow reed, and them coming through me and saying yes, <laughs> yes. And I had to pause for a second. I'm like, I said, oh, I don't want to mention the commissioner's name, but I said that wasn't me. I really had to think about it. It was like too late. <laughs> too late, too late, too late. And I was like, okay. I said, well, this is a very small community. Our African American organizations, businesses, cultural centers, museums, communities, we talk. So I knew that I had to go to my superintendent and say, only after nine months <laughs> in uniform, that. No, you remember back in October when you said I needed to apply for the job and, and I said, I think I'm going to do it. He's like, you have to. He wasn't upset. He's like, Victoria, you must. And I felt compelled at that moment with him giving me this kind of blessing to do it, even though the ancestors already told me what to do. I felt like it was okay because they have done so much for me. It's not an easy thing to become a National Park Ranger. I'm in such awe of our walking encyclopedias, our living libraries that stand 
proudly and tell the histories, the untold histories, and especially in the Reconstruction era, historical part can be true. Wow. So thank you, Al. I want to share a little bit about what you see up here. Someone very wise, an elder in our community, told me when I went up to college, you know, what are you going to do? We need people to come back home and stay home, to come back and do the work, go off, get the educa education, cash to learn it, and come on back home. I was like, I'm not coming back home. I'm going to New York City. <laughs> I'm going to New York City. I think all of us may have said that all the time. And then you get a little taste of it, and then you come back home. <laughs> Maybe not, but he said to me, the father, when I can look back, the father, when I can see, the farther you can look back, the farther ahead you can see. Well, in most cases, if your ancestry is tethered to enslavement, you are unable to look back far, as far as those lineages. And this is the case with the smallest family, the small side of my family. We knew very little about our lineage on my father's side, El Team Buster Smalls. <laughs> there was only one person in our community that was allowed to call him Buster. <laughs> um, and that was someone that was elder above him that he served as, as his mentor. Here you'll see him listed as ancestor because he's with the ancestors. And to the left, you will see my grandmother, ancestor Elizabeth Smalls, born in 1895. So we knew only what was written in our family Bible. We had the big King James Bible, about this big, white with gold embossed words on the front. It was one of my favorite things to look at when I was a little girl. They had the stories and lots of pictures. So at four and five, when I was not a reader or a strong reader because my language was Gala, uh, I looked at the pictures. But before I looked at the pictures, what compelled me was our family tree in the front. And so we only had the family Bible, what was written in the front in our family tree, the family Bible. And we only had the oral history of my grandmother, Ms. Smalls. Ashe. I say the word only, and however, in these terms, only is profound. It's going to turn out to be profound. It's like yesterday, and sometimes the gullah will come out yesterday. I can see it so vividly turning the pages of our family Bible. And we had to be really careful. I remember I was just flipping through it like this. And then my older sister, Omega, told me how, showed me how to follow your hand to get to the corner, touch the corner, go down, and glide over, like a librarian does. <laughs> <laughs> go to the corner, come down, turn the page gently. Because the Bible pages were so thin. I remember that. And like yesterday, I was about five or 10 years old yesterday. <laughs> and looking at our family tree, I would always go straight to that family tree and it fascinated me. And as a child, I often wonder what it would be like to know these people who are listed in this family tree. What they look like, do they, do I look like them? And what were their stories? What were our stories? I want to share another short story with you. And it's the story of when our family moved from St. Helena Island to Hilton Head Island. Very different. This was in the 1980 when we moved. I first attended an all Bella school, St. Helena Elementary School, where we were loved and nurtured by the educators. So when you spoke your language at that time, when I was attending, they didn't educate out of you. They didn't make you feel ashamed of speaking your language and your first language. Then we went to Hilton Head and I attended 
Hilton Head Elementary, we had this assignment to fill in a family tree chart. And immediately, oh, I've already got it written out. All I have to do is go to our family Bible, flip through the pages. I've seen it all before. I should have it permanently imprinted on my brain. I didn't. I did not. But as I was writing the names on the chart, I only can fill the lines up to my first great grandparents and some of their siblings. My first. Didn't know my second, my third, my fourth, on my father's side. <clears throat> so now my mother's side of the chart, I could go back to the 16th century, her British Wales ancestry, mine as well, her Irish ancestry, all of that. Had to get another chart to fill her side because it was overflowing, <laughs> right? And standing here today, I feel how ashamed and sad I felt and that I had all these gaps of missing information on my father's side, that many of the other students that were not Bella could fill in with ease. All the gaps. So let's go back to the oral history, the only. <laughs> my grandmother's only oral history. She shared many stories, not with me, but with my older sisters. But there was one story she shared with me, and my Grammy recalled her. My Grammy often shared that the story of her mother. Her mother, my first great-grandmother, was a runaway, a freedom seeker. Grammy said her mother with the last name Smalls ran away from Charles. Charles, Charleston, that's a girl coming out, Charleston. <laughs> when she was 14 or 15 years old, and I'm trying to add that up. Like how, I'm looking at this timeline of freedom and emancipation as it applies to my grandmother and my, her mother's age. And miraculously, this 14 or 15 year old, and courageously made her way from Charleston to St. Helena Island between 1861 and 1863. My first great grandmother. Typically that second, third, fourth, right? My grandmother did not share much more than that. We didn't know her first name. We didn't know what part of Charleston area she came from. If it was John's, James, Waterloo, Six Mile, like where Nakia would fall come from. Where downtown historical, we did. When people say Charleston, they say they say it's you know all encompassing because it has this you know presence. I wanted to know questions. How? Where does she come from? What compelled her to run from Charleston to St. Helena Island? How could she have? Could she have come? Actually, could she have come from McLeod Plantation? Magnolia Place, or some other site of enslavement. Could she have been one that was on a breeding plantation? And at 14, from 14 to 40, if you're a female and you're on a site of enslavement and you're 80% of the population is female, 14 to 40. Okay. I'm hoping you can read between the lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that why she ran? Was she running to find her people upon the St. Helena Island? I still have so many questions about that. So imagine this 14 year old, 1861, 1863, there is another part of the oral story, her oral history. Oh, um, when she left Charleston, she's going to stop on Edisville Island somewhere, maybe to rest something. And then I've heard stories that she was taken to St. Helena Island, and she made her way to St. Helena Island. Don't know, but I'm grateful. That's her again. I like to include images of our culture bearers within any presentation that I do. 
our new ancestor, Diane Britton Dunham, passed away three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago. Before she passed, she shared with me this image of the Gullah goddess in white with the full moon in the back along the water. And she said to me, when I saw the picture of her grandmother, this is what I saw. My grandmother, we would walk down, we lived on, we live on 20 acres of farmland, and you have this long dirt road that leads to Tom Frick Road, our main road. Tom Frick was a site of enslavement. You were 52 on St. Helena Island. 52. We would go down our dirt road, turn right on Tom Frick Road, and turn left on Pearl House Road to take her to prayer, to worship, Wednesday, Saturday, and sometimes Sunday after church, and if there was a meeting, community meeting, and if there was agreements that needed to be worked out in the community, you take it to the prayer house. They call that the just law. And if you had stepped out of the prayer house and didn't work out your grievances in the prayer house, and you went to lo local court, you were inviting harsher punishments and penalties to your community. And sometimes the judge would even send you back to the prayer house to go work it out. Yeah. So, let's show you this image. As a young lady, Attending high school and in college, I would often reflect back to my grandmother's story of her mother being enslaved and could see myself turning the pages of that family Bible again. I just, and for some reason, the family Bible went missing. I'm not sure someone, one of our family members, or hell holding on to it for safekeeping, but it went missing and I couldn't go back to my mother's house to turn the pages. So, right here, is a really important image for me. It's going to be the turning point in my life regarding learning more about my culture and the place where I grew up. During my first year at South Carolina State University, I attended our freshman seminars that were mandatory, and we did not like them. <laughs> and we, the first one I attended was at the IP Stand Back Museum and Planetarium. We did not know what we were going to walk into, but we felt that it was really important to engage ourselves or look like we were engaged. There was an exhibit hanging on the wall of black and white photography, and many people don't look at black and white photography as art. It is. I fell in love with it when I walked in. I fell in love with it before I walked into that museum, where my father had this picture of him as a 17, 18 year old um, soldier in the army with his uniform, uniform on. It was a black and white photo sitting on top of our, our upright piano in our house. So that's when I fell in love with it, because I could see my father as a young man. And then I walk into the museum and I see these images, about 16 by 20 in size, or 18 by 24, the largest. And I'm here, and the picture that you see here is all the way back at the end of our hall, at the curtain. And like a magnet that was pulling me, I couldn't really see what it was. It was pulling me and pulling me. And I get to the picture, I'm like, oh, that looked like my brother Danny. Oh my gosh. Bony like him, big eye like him, <laughs> jacket, members only jacket at that time. <laughs> but I was like, 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 like my brother Danny, and I'm saying this out loud to the freshman class that's standing behind me in the, in the museum. And I go down and I look at the caption, and it says, L. T. Smalls, student at Penn School, behind the two mule plow. 1940. I was to sucked all of the air out of the museum when I gasped. I'm like, Ooh! I'm like, that's my day. And then I was brought back to reality when my freshman classmate said, "Your daddy a slave?" 
Your daddy been a slave? And I was like, no, 1940. It says 1940. And, and, but it made me feel ashamed because they equated work in the land, work in the land, with enslavement and slavery. And let me tell you, there are many unassuming millionaires and up and coming wealthy people on St. Helena Island and many of our Nalangichi areas that work the land. Where do you think the food comes from at a grocery store and a restaurant? You don't have farms, you don't have food. I am so grateful that my father taught us how to work the land. So there was this picture. And I said, if this institution can recognize the importance of our place and our culture, then I need to pay attention. I was only 19, 18 years old. So it really did ignite me, <laughs> a fire within me. So then all the images within that museum came from the Penn School papers, Penn Center as we know it today on St. Helena Island. And I knew that my father was a graduate of Penn School. He graduated in 1943. But our history goes back a little bit further than that, as it pertains to Penn School. That's my daddy. Up the top row. Is that my signal to end? <laughs> <laughs> Second from in from the right. Top row, second in from the right. He's the tallest team member at 6'6". Six, six. But the other people standing up on the top row, top row so they can look tall as my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, in this picture also, we have one of our group doctors in this picture. I'm not gonna point him out right now. Well, I I will. This one, yeah. To come see campus. To come see capers. He, he was one of the healers, along with the Gregories on St. Helena Island. We call them root doctors. You can catch the healing with them. We catch everything. We catch the learning, we catch the healing, we catch the spirit, we catch the Holy Ghost. What else do we catch, bro? <laughs> we catch a lot. So catch the learning when you go to school and get educated right? So my father, we had the blessing of hearing my father sing, and I got to benefit from that. I can't sing. My son can sing. It missed me and passed on to my son. But my father had this amazing bass voice, and it matched his 6'6 six, six, um, commanding stature. Uh, he sang along with Deacon Garfield Smalls, who is featured in Voice of an Island, St. Helena. Bella Voice is Voice of an Island. They sang together in a duo called Smalls and Smalls. It's beautiful. One of his favorite songs that I can hear him sing now, Michael rode the boat ashore, hallelujah. Michael rode the boat ashore, hallelujah. Yeah, but it's voice and deep, 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 deep. And this was his favorite. I'm going to lay down my burdens. Down by the riverside. I'm going to lay down my burden. Down by the riverside. Riverside. I'm going to lay down my burden. Down by the riverside. River. Another image from the Penn School papers. I gotta, I gotta move on. <laughs> so, we're here. So, if Una ain't know what Una go on, then Una should know what Una come from. Come from. If you don't know where you're going, you need to know where you come from. So, it was here where I'm going to start learning at about 40 years old, that 40, 40 years old, some time ago, <laughs> that there were so many gaps of missing information within our timeline, our family tree, that I, I thought it was impossible for us to find. I decided that we should do a DNA test. 
with our family. We did African Ancestry and Ancestry.com and found so many amazing things. So you see West Africa. All of these are, are my family's ancestral, African ancestral countries. Like most Gullah Geechee people have all of these blendings within them. Then you may have a larger percentage where you come from, come from, you know, one country. So my largest percentage was Senegal. Then it shifted as we got more DNA data, and now it's Benin. So Senegal and Benin are strong. But I learned that we come from Mali, and our people migrated down through Guinea-Bissau, ended up in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, in Guinea-Bissau, and we were in Cote d'Ivoire. Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, and way down beyond the Congo. That filled me with an immense pride. I walked differently, I stood differently, I talked differently. It was amazing, I loved it. And then I shared this with my family, and they were like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, this is beautiful. So then a very good friend of mine, so Victoria, let's fill in some of those gaps. Show me the picture and the outline in your family tree from your family Bible, and let's get you your own land. Let's get your family records, and let's go back. She did that, and she went into the Freedmen's Bureau records and found this Freedmen's Bureau bank application from Beaufort, South Carolina. I know the date by heart, February 9, 1869. Adam Smalls and Betsy Smalls went into downtown Beaufort on Bay Street to the Freedmen's Bank to put money in the bank. And the bank registrar had to fill this out. And because he was so beautifully gullible and had that accent, he said, I'm going to fill in a bank application. I need to put the money in the bank. And my name, Adam Small. So the register wrote down Adam Small because sometimes other people take the S off the end. My name, Adam Small, proud. And it says, where are you born? St. Helena Island. Where were you brought up? Same place. Your residence, same place. And it's point, which was a place, another site of enslavement. He said he was about 35 because he did not know, because only eight years in 1861, he was enslaved. In 1861 in November, he was ceremoniously freed like all of the people in the Beaufort district in 1861. His complexion is dark brown, I imagine, like my daddy. His occupation is farming. And he works for himself on his own land. That stopped me in my tracks. My knees are weak. I have goosebumps all over my body every time I say that. That's the ancestor speaking to me. Below that, we learned about his wife's name, Adams, Betsy Smalls. We learned that his children's names are Tab, Andrew Robinson, and King, King Smalls. His daddy named Sancho. Now, had I known that when I was 29 years ago, when my son was born, I would have named him Sancho Smalls. He calls himself that today instead of Christopher. His mother's name is Afi. His brothers are Sancho Jr. and Abel. His sisters are Eliza Black, Louisa Seabrook, Edie McLeod, and Tenna. And all the way at the bottom, you can't see him maybe, but his, his signature is marked with an X because he cannot write, he cannot read, but doggone it. He got 59 acres of land. I said 59 acres of land. And money in the bank. Money in the bank. Now, this picture does not represent, it's not Adam and Betsy. It's what I think Adam and Betsy must have looked like when they didn't go to town to get put their money in the bank. Look at them. Other oh, another St. Helena Island picture in the Penn School papers. Either they're going to worship, the house of worship, the prayer house, or they're going to put money in the bank. That's what they look like with me. <laughs> and I like, in my mind's eye, this is exactly what Adam and Betsy Smalls look like. With that 59 acres of land that they purchased between 1863 and 1865 during the Civil War, they grew Sea Island cotton. Sea Island cotton about this tall, yeah. 
Yeah, this is how I like it. And that's some uh, of our people there. So they lost all their money. Embezzlement. The Freedmen's Bank was rife with embezzlement, which meant they couldn't pay their workers. Because at this time, you had you got paid for your work. Even in 1860, about 1862, 1863, you started getting paid for your work. So they had to pay their community members that were in that field of sea island cotton. Storms came, they also, and if your money was stolen, you couldn't pay your people and you couldn't pay the cotton gin, so they lost all 59 acres of land. They got it back. They lost them again. They got it back. Lost it again. And got 20 acres of it back that we still have today. With those land records, my friend was able to fill in some gaps. So I'm all the way down in the bottom where I say Nick. The I see that my daddy, Elton Bustle, in 1921. So I am the daughter of Elton Smalls, born in 1921, who is the son of Adam Smalls, Jr., born in 1896, who was the son of Andrew Smalls, born in 1861, the son of Adam and Betsy Smalls, born in 1830 and the son of Sancho Smalls and Affy. And going back to 1780, related to Taff and Venus. Let me tell you, we ought to be really careful because history repeats itself. And I must say that I'm extremely blessed to have mentors to have helped me, guide me along my path where I am today, Dr. Emmer Campbell, shared with me that the young people must step up and must accept the torch that is being passed on to them. He was looking me straight in my eye, and I realized, oh, he's talking about me and the other people. <laughs> and then there was a story in the Coastal Heritage Magazine about mentorship and the passing on of the torch in the Bella Geechee culture, and it featured Dr. Campbell, Mr. Michael Allen, and I. And it stated that Dr. Campbell passed on the torch to Michael, and Michael passed on the torch to me, although he still, he still got a hold of him. He and I are sharing that baton together, or that torch together. And when I was asked, who are you passing the torch to? I'm going to again. When I was asked who we are to passing the torch to, I felt silent. And I was like, oh. The reporter for the magazine asked me that. So I've identified lots of people, some, some in here today. You don't know who you are yet. <laughs> so last night in his keynote address, hidden in plain sight, the building of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, Brother Michael Allen mentioned this very thing. And more. He also made a profound statement about being silent. And he said, when we are silent about issues that matter, we are complicit. Complicit. Silence equals being in agreement. We all have, all have said and have heard others around us say that history repeats itself. Well, I would like to add that silence ensures that history repeats itself. Yeah. History and culture is far more than an academic pursuit. These subjects and stories are thought and taught and have significant contemporary meaning in the way that they frame current national perceptions and our individual realities, like that little five or 10 year old girl looking for the Bible. We, you and I, are attending this conference, the International Gullah Geechee and African Diaspora Conference, because we understand that that historical and cultural, that historical and cultural narratives have a critical impact on how we think of ourselves and behave today. Had I known where and who I come from, come from, from 
the age of 5, 10, 15, and even 20 years old, I would have stood differently, walked differently, act differently, and just be empowered beyond measure. But now I know. And when you know, you're empowered and you do better. It is my prayer that we are attending this conference because we understand it is imperative to share, include, and intentionally embed our stories within our work and the topics discussed here will be shared within our conversations in our communities, professional spaces, homes, and even within the stories we tell ourselves internally. Like that little girl in the Hilton Head Elementary classroom that felt ashamed because other people could fill in their time, their pantry, and I felt differently. It is my prayer that each of you, you and I, join in dialogue on topics that interest you that even are difficult and uncomfortable and consider points of view you may have perhaps not known or even considered. It is my ardent prayer that we are attending this conference because we truly comprehend the profound impact of our stories, the African American stories, the Gullah Geechee stories, and how they have a collective impact on the present and the future. Many of us, you and I, understand that historic and cultural preservation has much to offer our Gullah Geechee community seeking to protect and promote our tangible and intangible heritage. And all too often, we will find that we have failed to approach community members, our elders, our culture bearers, our youth, as collaborators with telling of their own stories and spaces and interpretation of us. Yes, it can mean a little bit more work for us, a little bit more on our to-do list, but it's imperative that we do so. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for being with me this morning. Please enjoy the conference and get a little uncomfortable. Don't be silent. Add to the dialogue and the conversation. And just want to say, I'm glad I'm going to say it in Ghana. I'm glad I'm going to say it in Ghana. I'm going to say it in Thank you.